Hello, Carl. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you too. Well, great. Okay. Nice to meet you. I'm Hakim. My pleasure, sir. Thank you for being here. I'm a huge Niles fan, so it's an honor. <laughs> <laughs> I see you've got quite a CD and uh, album collection. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff I enjoy. <laughs> And a few Nile records up there as well. <laughs> oh, nice. Very nice. Thanks. Well, um, let's start again. Uh, thank you for being here. So Nile is releasing a new album, The Underworld, Way to Soul on Napalm Records on August 23rd. So that's pretty soon. Um, uh, the, the label sent me the album beforehand, so I've been able to listen to it. So I have a few things to ask about it. Um, Most excellent. <laughs> so, um, well, one thing that I guess everyone that knows your band, Nile, uh, associates your sound and your music with is ancient Egypt, I guess, <laughs> quite obviously. But um, that's not all there is to it. You're known, of course, for portraying ancient Egypt since day one. But uh, here and there also there are elements of Sumerian, Akkadian mythology, so things from Mesopotamia. And the first track of this new record, Stellar Vultures, is about something from Mesopotamia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, it's currently in the Louvre, though. So it was in Mesopotamia. <laughs> now it's in the Louvre, the Stellar of Vultures. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the Stellar itself is a Sumerian artifact from somewhere around the third millennium BC. That's about uh, a war between the cities of Lagash and Emu, which is what the song is talking about, and the ruler yes. of Lagash, Anatum, who won. Um, so, um, of course, ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia have been known to have been in contact, so we can see the link, of course, between the two. But since you're mostly known for Egypt, could you tell us a bit more about the song and about your interest for Mesopotamian history and mythology and culture as well? Well, uh, it would be difficult to, you know, have an interest in Egypt and not also become aware of ancient Mesopotamian history as well. Um, so, to me, <laughs> it's not so crazy because there, there was a confluence of ideas, you know, the the idea of writing, the Mesopotamians wrote with cuneiform, right? And the Egyptians used hieroglyphs, um, but it's a very similar concept. Um, so, you know, you can see where ideas, you know, were definitely exchanged between the two civilizations. Uh, so to me, it's it's not such a crazy leap. Um, Egypt, Mesopotamia, well, why not? Yeah. Anyways, I, I would assume I mean, that is the case for me, for someone who just likes mythology in general, uh, to like one and the other anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they seem to be similar in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, some of their gods have equivalents and things like that mm -hmm. as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah. Um, so, on, I think only the first track draws from Mesopotamian lore. Uh, afterwards, we go back to Egypt itself. Um, the, the second track of uh, the record is it the second? I might be uh, I might be mistaken, but the one you've used as a first single to promote the the record, which ah. has a very long title, which. I'm going to spell in full for fun because otherwise it wouldn't be fun. Uh, it is fun. For not being hung upside down on a stake in the underworld and made to eat feces by the four apes. Fuck yes. Uh, yes. You did the shit out of that. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Uh, so a quick question about that song. Um, I want to know more about what these four apes were. I'm not sure about it myself, which is why I'm asking. Uh, I was thinking that maybe they were referring to the four sons of Horus. Uh, were involved in funerary rites. Is it that? Am I off track? Yes, that's exactly who we're talking about. The four apes of the underworld. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, 
And well, since we're talking about, uh, well, geographically speaking, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and well, let's say everything what we could encapsulate within the Middle East and also the Arabic world. Um, I, I, I'm wondering about a lot of things when you want to well, tell a story within a Nile album. Um, so lots of things date back from periods that are as old as antiquity, some older from potentially the Stone and Bronze Age. Um, of course, we know quite a few things about these times, but a lot of things are also very abstract. Yes, uh, we know stuff from things that we have in museums, in ruins here and there. Um, but of course, it probably is hard to actually tell a story with all of this, especially in music. And I'd like to know more about how you do that, how you pick events, characters, uh, and how you try and write a nice story for an album or a song. Mostly, um, I have a big bookshelf. Uh, right over there, you can't see it. It's on that wall. Mostly, I'll just go get a book when it's time to write an owl song. I'll just open it. And wherever that page is open to, that's a song. This doesn't always work, though. It's a terrible way to write songs because most of the time you open the page and you see nothing there to write a song with. Okay. <laughs> We'll try again tomorrow. <laughs> so once in a while, though, you open the book up and you see something that you can work with. And I like to think of this as the randomness of the universe. The universe seems random. It probably isn't, though. It's <laughs> a chaotic system that we're not capable of fully understanding because of our perspective in relation to the universe. The universe is bigger than we are. So we can't see the whole thing of how it operates. So what does this got to do with writing songs? Well, when I stumble across something that seems interesting to me, now I've got something to work with. Uh, and whatever that may be, that gives me an idea of where to go look for more of that idea to finish the song with. So it's kind of a crazy way of working, but it works for me. Well, as long as it works. <laughs> but uh, so if you pick things at random, are there sometimes where you open a page and you're like, no, I don't necessarily like that. Not that you could make a song with it, but you want to turn the page and look for something else. Right, because we're a metal band. So, right, we're looking for topics that are going to work in metal songs. Not everything that one finds about ancient history is worth writing a metal song for. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, fair point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, sometimes that random way of doing it, it yields nothing. Um, but it's a fun way to work, right? Because there's always a surprise, like, okay, I didn't think this was going to be a song, but okay, here we go. No, I mean, I like the idea, personally. I, mean, it, I had never heard of that way of doing things, but it's interesting enough. Uh, and it works, again, I've been listening to this band for probably a bit more than 15 years, I mean, since I was a teenager or so, so it's been working for me as well, and for a lot of <laughs> people, I guess. <laughs> That's what matters. Is it yeah. a song? Is it something that we want to listen to? That's what matters. Yeah. And so in terms of these stories, uh, um, in this record, well, uh, which is to some extent maybe expected since you just said, well, there are things you may want to create a metal song with, others not. And this is also not any metal, it's rather death metal. So it focuses a lot on, well, F in the underworld in ancient Egypt. Um, Egyptian culture had a uh, firm belief in the afterlife and lots of things that happened after death. Uh, there were lots of deities that worked through that, that lived within the, uh, let's say, Egyptian inferno, which several names like Duat or Amente, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. right. um, so uh, a question about that is, uh, well, the turn of a record seems to be about, well, death and also its inevitability to some extent. 
And well, if you set the afterlife in Egyptian lore aside, uh, do you write something like that? Also thinking about topics in the real life, mirroring, let's say, death in the real life as well, or is it specifically anchored within Egyptian mythology? No, I think if if we look back at Nile lyrics, Nile songs, although we are talking about ancient Egyptian history, it's very much aware of our own feelings about things. Um, like how I think of something or history or how I want to write the song has a lot to do with how I see the world or how I see the world as it may have existed a couple of thousand years ago, right? My perspective is still my perspective. <laughs> And it's going to be in there no matter what I do. So I'm okay with that, though. Like, you know, we were talking about stelae of vultures earlier, yeah. right? Um, which is, you know, we know a, a fair amount about the battle between Lagash and Uma and the stuff that A and Adam did. But when I think about that song, I think about, well, okay. Why was he so savage and barbaric to the Umite soldiers that he had defeated? Why did he kill them all? Why did he feed them to the vultures? You know, why did he trample on them, smash them, mutilate their bodies? Why was all this done? Um, but one thing people don't think about is early in the battle, he was shot in the eye with an arrow. Okay. So I've never been shot in the eye with an arrow, but I have to think that it fucking hurts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if Mr. A and Adam guy was in, you know, this kind of agonizing pain, right? Got shot in the fucking eye with an arrow. Now he he's going to be, angry. he must have been fucking pissed. Yeah. Right, so this is why all those Umite soldiers got slaughtered, hacked to bits, fed to the vultures. That's why, because he was fucking pissed. Any thought of mercy that he might have had at the beginning of the day, as soon as he got shot with an arrow, no, fuck you guys motherfucker shot me in the fucking eye with a fucking arrow fuck you that's what i think happened makes sense <laughs> it makes sense to me right because that's how i would feel if somebody shot me in the fucking arrow and i was going to be half blind the rest of my life i'm in agonizing pain that never I'm happened to be me merciful as well, also probably be angry yep <laughs> So, thanks. Continuing with the underworld uh, and talking about the cover artwork of the record. Um, so, what we see is, it seems to be like maybe the whole of the underworld gushing out of a pyramid in some kind of giant whirlwind. Uh, what, what did you want this cover to say? Well, we didn't uh, really know. So, when it came time to talk with Zay, we gave him the lyrics, we gave him the song titles, we told him what the songs were about, we even gave him the demos from the album so he could hear the songs. And we said, here, do whatever you want. We love you, man. Make an album cover. So that's all him. Oh, and well, you like it then. <laughs> well, <laughs> of course we like it we like everything he does he's he's yeah. a, a great guy um so you know all credit on that is for him not us we didn't come up with it we didn't tell him what to do okay well it's him i'd need an opportunity to ask him <laughs> okay thanks um so earlier i was talking about well uh the arabic world the middle east and all of this that's in your music as well, uh, but talking about the music itself, uh, here and there on every Nile record, and um, also on the music you do solo, um, you hear 
influences from uh, Middle Eastern music or Arabic music, let's say traditional music in, in general, uh, I, I would imagine this is conscious. I would imagine this is something you enjoy. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm interested in hearing more about this kind of music and these influences and how you try and put them in metal. Well, it's it's simpler than one would think. Like, if I hear something, like I'm listening to something, you know, whatever music, and I pick up the guitar, and I like go, okay, this is, I think this is it. I think I got it right. And you learn a little bit, you know, a lick or a, the piece of music or or whatever, and then you play it on the guitar. Well, the next step is, you know plug it into the martial amp and play it loud it's that it's, simple yeah well fair enough i mean it's it's probably better if it's simple but it, it, i'm always asking questions because in my head lots of things are meant to be complex but are not necessarily as bad <laughs> just really right over complicating things sometimes i think that's that's with a lot of aspects of human understanding um like we try to make things like way more complicated, but the simple answers are usually the ones that are closest to the truth. Why does it have these influences? Well, because I learned something on guitar and I played it loud and it became metal. It was not metal before, but as soon as you plug it in to a big, loud, distorted Marshall amp, it's going to come out metal. Yep. Fair enough. Great. Um, so earlier I was talking a bit about uh, how you pick a topic for a new song. So you told me about your books. I was actually, again, you know, complicating things in my head, thinking about, well, another, uh, let's say, uh, potential inspiration. I was imagining you maybe strolling in museums and looking at artifacts there to think about stuff. And I would assume anyone writing song about ancient Egypt probably enjoys museums as well and artifacts. Yeah. Me too. Weird. <laughs> it would be weird if, if this wasn't the case. Uh, and for example, well, the, the, the Stele of Vultures uh, from the first song is actually at the Louvre Museum in, in France, in Paris. Um, so if you do enjoy museums, uh, is it also, uh, well, one way to maybe pick topics if you wander in museums from time to time? And also, um, could you maybe uh, tell us more about uh, your interest in these artifacts, maybe also outside of music? I remember that uh, in, in an older record on what should not be on earth, you had a song called To Destruction that uh, was uh, calling out against, well, the destruction of artifacts uh, in, uh, in war-torn countries. Uh, so, of course, that made it obvious that uh, you love these things, of course. Um, so could you could you maybe tell us more about well museums artifacts and things like that? Well, I love museums because like you walk in and it feels like you're instantly transported to another time, another place. It's it's super inspiring. It makes your imagination go like really. Uh, into creative places like even if you see something simple <laughs> like uh the museum in cairo is full of all kinds of incredible stuff like every corner of the cairo museum has something cool in it right you can't not want to write songs after you've been there um yeah yeah, I mean, that's obvious. And well, you, you kind of answered to one of my other questions, which, of course, the answer was obvious, uh, which was, do you go to Egypt from time to time? And also, has the band played there before? Band's not going to be playing in Cairo anytime soon. Um, metal bands are very frowned upon there. There are a few bands from Egypt, but bringing an American band in there, yeah, I don't think yeah, it's going to happen. It's not, it's not necessarily easy, and I know that the musical scene in general is not necessarily too open of there, and not necessarily also not very diverse when it comes to metal. But I do know as well a few bands from Egypt, they probably know about those as well, like Scarab or Crescent, mm -hmm. but also, well, 
uh, write stuff about Egyptian mythology. Um, I assume you know them. Maybe not. Sorry if that's the case. Uh, but uh, have you played with such bands? Because some of them do play outside of their country from time to time. When we played with Scarab uh, when we played in Dubai. Mm -hmm. um, Scarab was there, but I'd already known them for years. I, I did a guest solo on one of the records. Um, yeah, known them for a long time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, going back to the record, The Underworld the Way to Soul, um, I have a question about the last track, which is called Lament for the Destruction of Time, uh, which surprised me because it's an instrumental. Uh, well, mm -hmm. We're used to have instrumentals as interludes in, on Nile records. There's always one or two on every record, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but this is a full closing track, which is something like five minutes long. Um, I mean, it's great. Uh, but how do you end up uh, writing an instrumental like that? And why maybe an instrumental at the end? Uh, I know this has happened before. I think on an older record in the Dark and Shrine, there was also... Uh, an instrumental at the end of a record, so it's not exactly new, although it's been a while. Uh, but how you, do you go about that? Well, it, it just kind of happened. Um, I remember Brian had been working on this slow piece of music. It was very doomy, uh, and he, but he didn't have any words for it. Um, I had been working on some uh, lyrics for a song uh, taken from the lament for the destruction of Uruk. Mm -hmm. It was big, huge, long uh, Sumerian poem about the destruction of Uruk. And along with another poem, a lot like it, called Lament for the Destruction of Ur, <laughs> I had taken all these words and like, you know, made, made a song out of it. So Brian had some music, no words. I had some words and no music. So I went, hey, maybe this will work. But it didn't, right? Uh, it, like, Brian's thing didn't need any fucking words. It was great, just like it was as an instrumental. So we kept the title. Mm -hmm. But then we went, wait a minute. Uh, Brian came up with the idea why don't we call it Lament for the Destruction of Time? Because, like, as soon as George Coleus started playing this song, it was wall-to-wall -wall destruction on the drums. It wasn't really a doom song anymore. Now it was destruction of time because of what George does. George doesn't just keep time. George destroys time and reinvents it. <laughs> Well, he's a great drummer. Um, yes, he is. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when Brian suggested this, it sounded exactly like, yeah, um, Lament for the Destruction of Time. It's a much bigger concept, right? Because yep. with the ruins of Uruk and Ur, which, you know, are three and a half, four thousand years old, It's kind of like everything that they did with those great magnificent cities has been ravaged by time, mm -hmm. right? Um, so in a way, you know, it really seemed like a connected sort of concept. Um, mm -hmm. When we listened to the track, like there was no way that you could put anything after like if you tried to imagine sticking this song in the middle of the record yeah it had to be the last one it had to be the last one because it takes you down to a place and keeps you there and it's like the music at the end of a movie when the credits are rolling that's what that track is like okay M makes sense and so since you uh, you had lyrics do you think you might use them later on another record, or would you just scrap them? Who knows? A lot of times things get scrapped, right? Yeah. If there's always songs that don't make a Nile record. Um, it's once we decide that, you know, this song isn't quite good enough, 
we stop wasting time on it. Um, sometimes those songs come back years later because we hadn't forgotten them and the idea is still laying around. Sometimes as time goes by, you realize what you should have done with the song. Right? Why wasn't this a great song? It was almost a great song. And you realize later on. And sometimes you realize this is not a song at all, but that riff is good, and this drum beat is good, and this other thing is good. So it's like a cannibalization where you carve it up, chop it, reassemble it into something new. Makes sense. Um, and uh, one other thing musically, so you, you mentioned that uh, when that song came up, um, it was a bit doomy. And I, I, I was wondering about, about that as well, because I felt there were a few parts in the record, uh, especially on the title track, The End of World Which Waits Us, which is kind of a title track. Uh, it's it's a bit doomy as well here and there, um, which is great. I love doom as well. <laughs> So uh, is is it also something that just let's say happened like that, uh, or was it on purpose that we have doomy parts? Yeah. Well, some riffs are slow and doomy, and some riffs are fast and brutal, yeah. and we like all of them. So <laughs> some happened. songs have doomy parts. I like doom metal, but I also like brutal metal. It's okay. You can put them in the same song. Of course, of course. It'll work out. Of course. Okay. Um, so, well, the record is due later this month. Um, do you already have some touring scheduled for that record? Maybe for later this year or possibly next year? Because I know you've been touring already earlier this year, but that was before the record was announced. So Right. Uh, we've got a European tour coming up in September. Um, uh, we're not going everywhere we need to go, so there's probably going to be a part two. We'll come back in springtime and mm -hmm. go to all the countries we missed the first time. Uh, in October, we're going to Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, right. uh, Bangkok, a few other places in there. Um, then in the States... In January and February, we're going out with Six Feet Under as a co-headline. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be good. And there's talk about Canada in the summer, which I guess if you're going to go to Canada, summer is the time to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man, I don't want to go to Canada in the winter again. No, sir. Yeah. Hopefully anything in France, because I, I, I did not mention it, but I am French. I had guessed that. <laughs> yeah. So anything in France maybe for the European tour? Probably in springtime because um, yeah. I don't think there's any French dates in September. Um, there's also no Eastern Bloc dates, nothing Scandinavia. So yeah. there's plenty of places we still got to go. So there's going to be a part two of this yeah. tour, yeah. rest assured. Great. Well, hopefully see you there. Um, and uh, you mentioned that you were going to Japan and other parts of Asia. Are there places that you've never been to that are going to be on this tour? Because I know some places nope. that are obviously easy to get to. But... There are some places that are not so easy to get to, but we've been every place. Well, Tasmania, right? We've never been to Tasmania, so that'll be new. <laughs> well, good for them. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, we're getting to the end of my question. So again, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, it's been great talking with you. Um, well, uh, this interview will be uh, online sometime later. Uh, people will be able to uh, listen to it. Uh, do you have any last words for our viewers? Anything you want to tell them? Uh, the underworld awaits us all. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you. So again, the new record is out on Napalm Records uh, on the 23rd of August. Go pre-order it or get it in a record store near your place whenever you can. And well, see you on tour. Thanks again for being here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Well, uh, it was fun for me too. So uh, 
<laughs> hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I assume you have other people to talk to afterwards, so I'm not going to uh, bother you too much. Well, thank you for your thoughtfulness. I will appreciate you all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you.